Hello and salams. I'm Rabia and welcome to Hidayah's podcast, Istame, which means listen, bringing you cutting edge dialogue on what it means to be LGBTQI plus and Muslim. Hidayah are the fastest growing LGBTQI plus Muslim organisation that provide a vital nationwide support system for us and by us. The word Hidayah derives from the Arabic word for guidance. We're proud to bring you honest, raw and personal stories from our members so you can better understand what life is like for us. Joining me today in the studio are Shalina, founder and chair of Hidayah, Sara, member of Hidayah and Muhammad, member of Hidayah. Today we'll be discussing the shame and stigma of what it is like to be LGBTQI plus and Muslim. So, Sara... What is the stigma of being LGBT and Muslim? So I think one of the things that we need to bear in mind when we look at stigma or look at anything to do with shame, because that stigma and the shame sort of are are side by side here. Um, For me, that shame comes from the community. Now, if you look at the dictionary definition of shame, it's a feeling of humiliation or distress caused by uh, wrong or foolish behaviour. So let's dissect what that means. Why is there a stigma? Why do we think that people are feeling that this is wrong or foolish? And then that cuts right through to the heart of your identity. So the stigma is not about um, other people. It's about me feeling my identity is not valid in the context of what other people think. And so for me, it's all around, that's the core concept for me around how we can look at stigma and shame in the LGBT and Muslim community. Now, to answer the question more directly, what is the stigma? The Muslim community used to be a very tolerant uh, community. When we're talking historically, hundreds of years ago, there was a lot more um, there was a lot more understanding of different forms of identity, different forms of um, of behaviour, and uh, a lot more tolerance for those. In more recent years, we've seen the rise of intolerance, not only in in the Muslim community and not only in Islam, but um, globally, we can see things like Brexit, um, you know, the rise of of hard right extremists across the world um, coming into this level of intolerance. So for me, um, the stigma isn't something that is inherent in Islam or being a Muslim. The stigma is there because for whatever reason, the world has moved to a more intolerant state over time. So why do you think it is that uh, tolerance has decreased over time in the Muslim community? I don't know. I mean, we can look at historical factors. If you look at the the historical age of Islam and how Islam has grown over time, I think that with the colonial wars, with uh, segregations into countries, more tribalism coming in, Um, those things moved people away from looking at Islam and their identity as a Muslim community, one global community under one, if you like, the caliphate at the time, which was one big global community. Um, That got lost and it got replaced by more um, nationalistic boundaries. And so with that, you then have some tension around, I'm one nation and there's another nation. So these things can uh, cause that. Um, I don't think we're going to get to the heart of why it's happened. Um, I think we are where we are now. And I think when you look at the stigma that's currently in our community around being LGBT and Muslim, um, it comes from a lack of understanding of the heart of Islam, um, which for me is about um, tolerance, love, compassion for all of humanity. If we look at his behaviour, his ikhlaq, it was always one of inclusivity. He never shunned anyone away. He was always welcoming. He was full of compassion and love. And there are many, many examples in the Hadith about um, his charity, his compassion, his love, his understanding, um, not only for different types of people, uh, but different classes, different ethnicities. He really united people under a banner of tolerance, compassion and love. And that's for me, that's the heart of Islam. And that gives us a reflection on what Allah is. Allah is about love at its at, at his core. The, his messages are about love. 
And so if we start from uh, that message, for me, the key thing is looking, um, looking forward that way. And I think people have lost that way of looking at things and have become much more uh, dogmatic in the way that they have decided to interpret specific uh, scripture. I think for me, the kind of stigma shame is like growing up as a woman. I think culturally there's there's a difference between men and women in our cultures, if you're from a South Asian kind of culture. And for me, is that kind of honour that is a... And for me, shame derived from that. You know, I was always constantly brought up to kind of to get the good grades, not for myself, more for what will family say, what will other people say in the community. You know, you have to behave a certain way when it comes to weddings, etc. There's always something there. And that, for me, is where this stigma of shame comes from. People have this notion that when you come out, that's like the end of your journey. I feel like for LGBT Muslims, coming out is kind of midpoint of the journey mm. because half the journey is coming out to yourself. Yeah, It's definitely. navigating your own mental illness because inevitably most if not all of us go through things like depression and anxiety we feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders what will the community say what will x y z say mm. especially if your family and most of us do our family have such a standing in the community that's where that shame comes from and i think a lot of that is to do with our culture and it's to do with their their interpretation of islam and a lot of our elders don't have that learned kind of islam is about love and compassion with anything, when something's gone down the generations, you lose a bit of it. Like, as British Asians, we can't speak our mother tongue as well as our parents can because they've primarily come from those countries, right? I know that my Bengali isn't going to ever be as good as my, my parents because they were born and brought up there. With anything that's passed on generation to generation, something gets lost. And unfortunately for us, the Islam that's kind of been passed down the love and the compassion, the inclusivity has been lost. Sometimes Islam is used as a scaremongering tactic. And that, for me, is where the stigma of shame has come from. For me, it's kind of the invalidation, I guess. I mean, Sarah and, and Shalina have both kind of have, have touched upon it. And I would, the only thing I would add to that is the invalidation, I think, just picking up from, from what Sarah said. And it's kind of like you're told that you cannot be this way, even though that's kind of how you fundamentally feel. And therefore, you feel like you're wrong. Um, and that's and that's you know shameful, but there's an you know there's an, it's kind of multi layered as well. I mean, coming from a South Asian background, then as as Shalina quite rightly said, there's that standing in the community thing. So my family, where kind of and where I live, I'm very embedded within the community. So when I go to the mosque, I know most of the people over there. And if I kind of came out and I said I wanted to walk into the same mosque again, I mean I'm gonna get stares and looks more than I already do because you know I'm quite loud and I talk a lot and I make a lot of crap jokes. <laughs> Um, so, and that's like, that's like a level of attention I do not need when I'm walking into a mosque and, you know, I wouldn't be able to face the same people again. Um, I, I just don't need that. So the, so there's a lot of like, yes, there's a religious thing. Yes, there's a cultural thing. And yes, there's sort of like the everyday practical things as well. You're trying to go to the, you know, go pray to your local mosque or you're going, you know, to the shop to go and get something from the local corner shop. But because you know, every, everybody knows you and you know, everybody it's a lot more difficult to do that. So what do you do? It's just easy, right? So you just stay quiet. Uh, you kind of you keep it all in, you bottle it all in, and then you end up leading this sort of double life. And that double life, as much as it gives you happiness, when you're sort of doing it, because that's that level of freedom, at the end of the day, you you know that you kind of have to, you know, walk back into the closet when you walk through the front door again. Um, and that's, you know, there's a sense of shame that comes from leading that double life as well, because you don't, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to lie to everyone. Um but that's essentially what we're doing. That's what you, you sort of have to do to protect your own back. Um, and at some point, it takes its toll on, 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 a, on a person. You know, you either leave or, you know, you end up collapsing in your own house in a flood of tears. Um, and I'm sure that rings true for a lot of people. How has stigma and shame impacted your lives and impacted your experience? And I had a very interesting situation occur to me. So I came out to myself a few years ago. Throughout my life, I grew up not really understanding my identity because um, I, uh, although I was assigned male at birth, I um, identified very much with girls and the things that they were doing and the clothes they were wearing and their acti the activities which were traditionally assigned to the female role. And for me, that was kind of weird. So uh, when I tried to move in that direction, society always pushed me back 
towards what my assigned role was uh, to be male, to like sports or whatever it was. And whereas I would prefer very much so to sit with girls and have a chat. Um, so um, it was it was quite difficult growing up and looking at the world, uh, not really understanding that. And right through from quite early on, um, I knew that there wasn't some something was incongruous something wasn't quite right um but the feelings for me the feelings came and went so um i didn't really give it much mind they came sometimes and then i sort of dealt with it and then they went away again and i thought sort of said okay that's all right and when i finally came out to myself i realized that i needed to explore what this meant and um actually coming out to myself and and affirming to myself that yes I am transgender that was a huge weight off my shoulders but then I thought what does that actually mean mm. so um, the traditional view of transgender is somebody who is going to transition from male to female and my feelings came and went it wasn't a constant feeling through my life that I was assigned the wrong gender at birth so what what kind of transgender does this does this mean i have to abandon my feelings as a, as a male completely um and uh, i didn't really understand it so i explored it and in exploring it you don't really want to come out to everybody immediately before you really understood it yourself so <clears throat> one of the things and a lot of trans people will identify this with this probably is i went to the shops to try to find clothes to see what that would look like and there's a bit of a societal awareness that a guy shouldn't be dress shouldn't be shopping for women's clothes. So I'd go to the shop, I'd load up my basket, I'd pay for it, I'd go home, try them all on, and come back the next day and return probably all of them most of the time. And I got sick of this. And at one point, I said to myself, "I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to load up my basket and go to the changing room." And I steeled myself up. I loaded my basket and I put some male looking items at the top. So there were jeans at the top and then there were some more feminine items towards the bottom. And I went to the male dressing room because I was presenting as male, of course. And the uh, the security guard, and I'll never forget, he was six foot something, huge guy, built like a house. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, how many items? And I said, 10. And he kind of saw my nervousness and thought, hmm, this, this guy's dodgy. So um, he said, I'm going to have to count them. I thought to myself, right, just turn away and run. And that was the shame talking, right? That was the shame saying to me, you shouldn't be doing this. Society tells you this isn't what you should be doing. And so I wanted to run and I didn't. I stayed. I let him count the items. And as he counted them, his numbers got more and more confused. So it was like one, two, three, four. <laughs> and um, he got to five and he said, are you sure you want to try these? And I said, yes. And inside I was screaming, no, run away, run away. <laughs> um, and uh, I stood my ground and uh, he carried on counting. He got to seven and he said, are you sure you want to try these? And at this point, I really thought that's it. I give up. And something inside me said, no, you've got to this point. You've just got to stay strong and go a little bit further. And so I said to him, yes. And then I had added, do you have a problem with that? Oof. Yeah. And uh, I see you all like smiling at that. It wasn't a natural thing for me to do. I'm not a confrontational person. But I felt that in that moment, I'd come to that point and he continued to question me. I thought I had to question him. Within a microsecond, his whole demeanour changed. He shrunk back. He became like a child. And I realised in that moment that something that I thought, which was my shame, actually I converted it into power. And actually the shame that I was feeling was because I had given him power over me. And I think that's what we all do. We allow society to have that power over us by this p perception that we're doing something wrong. And when you challenge that perception and you say, yes, have you got a problem with it? And you stand your ground and you take that power back, 
that shame just dissipates, it vaporizes, it just completely melts. And this guy became really accommodating and he didn't even count the rest of the items. And he just handed me the bat- basket and said, no, 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 not at all. You go on your way. And I have to say, I got into the changing room and I couldn't move for about five minutes. I was shaking because of all the emotions that I'd gone through in that, you know, it felt like an hour. It was like probably a minute that this this whole interchange took place. But the whole thing sits with me now as something quite powerful because now I just refuse to let people have that power over me. I retain my power and I'm not going to let you you and your attitude dictate what I feel. If I've done nothing wrong and if I'm not behaving foolishly, if I'm being, if I'm sitting in my identity and doing things appropriate for me and I'm not doing anything illegal and I'm not doing anything that's you know going to compromise my ethics or anything like that I'm doing something that is um, uh, that is true to me if I'm doing something that's true to me that's not foolish and it's not wrong and therefore the shame that other people want to put on me I won't accept that's such an important story. What a powerful story. Does anybody else have any stories of, of shame and stigma they'd like to share, perhaps? The way that I think about shame recently has been massively influenced by a book that I'm currently reading, which is The Velvet Rage by Alan Downs, which if anyone hasn't read it, I'd definitely recommend it. It's um, it's primarily geared towards gay men, so there is that sort of caveat because that's the, uh, that's the, you know, that's the clientele that he works with. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's, it's it's really good reading and it talks about shame um, and how even though people have consciously kind of gotten rid of that shame. So, we were, you know, a person might have come out when they were 13, 16, you know, 21, 18, whatever it is. They're like, uh, you know what, I'm now living my life. And, and, and so they do. But the shame that they kind of live with up until that point um, kind of manifests in certain ways that they don't necessarily always realize. So that's something that I'm constantly working at. It's that kind of subconscious level that shame leads you to kind of seek external validation a lot because that kind of feeling that you're comfortable with yourself, that development, if you like, just hasn't happened properly. That's been stunted. That's been stopped um, or at least um, warped. So what people end up doing as they go throughout life is kind of covering all of that up. And there's this really powerful line in there. I mean, I can't quote it to you, you know, verbatim, but there's that really, there's really powerful line as I think it ends the introduction, which is that for all the flamboyantness and for all the kind of like, you know, amazingness and, you know, the kind of amazing exterior, what it's actually hiding is the painful truth of self-hatred. Um, and that, if you like, even though you might say to yourself that I am no longer ashamed of who I am, that kind of, if you like, that self-hate, even though that's perhaps that might not be the term that we would give it or somebody else might give it, but that's the term that he uses, um, that manifests itself in different kinds of ways. So you're always almost trying to prove yourself to the world by being more extra, by being more flamboyant, by being kind of, you have to be the best writer, you have to be the best dressed, you have to cook the best food, I have to have the best house, I have to have the, you know, everything has to be perfect. That level of perfectionism, because you've always felt adic- inadequate in your life. Um Oof, hard hitting. You yeah, the it really the is. I mean, I re- I got to the end of that introduction and I almost cried. But yeah, so that's that's the kind of that's where I'm at, if you like, with it. So whereas I don't feel I'm a lot more secure in sort of identity and self, if you like. So um, when you know a homophobe would come up would say that you know you can't be gay and Muslim, now I'm more inclined to laugh at that than I am to kind of like, oh my god, I, how could you say that? Even though I am thinking like, oh my god, what the hell? Not again. Um, but you know, I'm more I'm more likely to just sort of laugh it off and forget about it. But when you hear that as a kid, when you hear that for such a long time, um, and this isn't exclusive to kind of whether you're you know gay and Muslim or whether you're gay of a you know it's from as far as I can understand it, this is the thing of, of sexuality in and of its of non heteronormative sexualities, and I would probably say gender as well. Though I I guess that would be my opinion, but I I couldn't like back that claim up. But somebody else would have to would have to speak on that who's you know who's not me um and and that's something you're sort of constantly battling and sort of living with and i think a lot of people perhaps don't have that awareness i guess i've come out i'm you know i'm out and proud i go to prides and blah 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 and that's great what they don't see is that there's been years of damage of coded messages that you know you're not right you are not correct this is not right all those coded shaming if you like and that takes 
that takes years to be able to kind of unravel and unpick. That is so powerful. I think that resonates with so many people. Shalina, what about you? In terms of stories, yeah, I've got, like with everyone, I've got quite a few, but I've come out to my family and I find that I'm kind of over the shame bit. I am out and proud to family, to friends, colleagues. And I'm a bit different and a lot of my friends, and I think Sarah and kind of, and even you, Rabbi, can attest to this, I just take no more bullshit anymore. I'm kind of at that point of, actually, this is my life and I'm going to lead it how I want to. There is, however, moments where I actually struggle to come out to straight Muslims, if I, especially if they're South Asian. And I know why, is because they are the picture of where my shame kind of triggers from growing up. Definitely. I mean, like, I find I'm far more comfortable um, in kind of, like, gay spaces and non-Muslim spaces some yeah. of the time. Yeah. Um, like, sometimes walking into my own local mosque can be difficult. I mean, no one knows. Yeah. But it doesn't matter that no one knows. It's the fact that... They are what... They're the coded yeah, messages. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and uh, particularly uh, for me, it's kind of straight male Muslim spaces for me can be quite... Difficult and challenging. Yeah. yeah. Like, even going to different Jummas in different... You know, if I'm in a different city for work or wherever it is, I'm just not in my local mosque at that day. I mean, that can be like... Yeah, I mean, that can be quite stressful. Yeah. And I think that shame derives from the fact that growing up, we've had to deal with the kind of, like, as Mahama mm. says, the coded messages and stuff. So, for example, if I'm in a workspace and I know that someone's Muslim and they're South Asian, I won't come out. And that is something I'm doing consciously, whereas I'm out to all my other colleagues. And that completely derives from the fact that that's that person. And it's also, I think, my family know, but they're ashamed of me being gay. Um, and that's difficult because you're kind of, I feel like sometimes, whilst I'm not ashamed of being gay, um, I feel like vicariously I'm living that shame now through my family. You know, when you're at weddings and it's like, this is the last one left to get married. Mm. And it's like, there's, I can see the shame from my family's eyes. That's so difficult. Uh, yeah. And I know I'm not the only one in that situation. When you're kind of at the point where I think all of us are now, here, where we've come out to ourselves, we're out to our friends, family, etc. Whilst we've gone on our journey and I'm now on the other side, alhamdulillah, the thing that triggers the shame, not triggers, but brings the shame back is through my family now. And it's now living vicariously through them, which is difficult because actually, how do you then navigate that? How do you deal with, you know, going to weddings and your parents saying, oh, well, Shaleen is never going to get married. You know, the whole grand Asian wedding that we have how do we, what do you say to that? Cause, what do you, know, you say to that? How well, do I, you do I, that? Well, I'm a bit different, aren't I? So I always say to my mum, I will get married, but it's to a woman. Um, at which point it's either, it's just that, again, the disappointing look in her eyes. Mm. And actually what needs to be said here is that I'm, I'm first generation British born and bred. And I think sometimes we forget that our parents have had to endure a lot in their lives. So they've emigrated from a country that is like Bangladesh, Pakistan and India are quite forward countries now. You know, they've got hijras, they've got the third genders, but our parents weren't around to see that. Yet when they immigrated here, they came when on the posters you had no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. So again, the shame for us or for our families derived from the unknown. They don't, they've never been in that space before. And so how do they navigate that? And they don't know anyone else. Whereas I know that there's like two two girls that I went to school with who've actually come along to Hidai events. And we That's were all, amazing. yeah, and we've all, but equally it's like our parents won't want to know that as well. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. It's that shame. But I think in a generation or two's time, that won't exist anymore. You oh. know, um, my nieces and nephews all know I'm a lesbian and they have no issues with it. But kids are a little bit easy to do. Mm. My, my siblings are, are okay, just about okay with it. But I think it's, you know, just constantly, I think showing them that you're, that you're still the person that you are. And that takes time. I think when you're LGBT and Muslim, everything takes yeah. time. Time heals. But at the moment, I feel like my shame kind of, I lived that vicariously through my family now. And it's unfortunate, but I know, again, it will get better. So, what do you think it will take to be fully accepted as LGBTQI plus and Muslim by both the LGBTQI plus community and Muslim communities? Or do you feel that the tide is already changing? 
we look at kind of sexuality in this country and the gay rights movement and stuff like that, things are still not perfect, things are still not right. How long has that been going on? It's been going on for decades. Um, in terms of gay Muslims and Hida and stuff, we've been around for a few years. There is a long way to go. So I don't think it, I don't think we'll ever get to that stage where it'll become fully accepted. But is it getting better? Yes, it is. Will it continue getting better? I think definitely. The work of Hida and other organizations, I'll, I'll add to that as well, is, is kind of instrumental in that. And the other thing I would add is um, that it takes it takes a lot of conversations. It doesn't for me anyway. When I when I talk about activism and you know a lot of this is very kind of activism related, isn't it? In terms of me and and personally, when I think of activism, I'm not talking about being on streets with placards and marching and stuff like that. That is a form of protest, and that is you know sometimes the right thing to do. But I'm far less likely to be there. What I'm for my, what I'm more likely to be doing is having conversations with my colleagues, with my friends and stuff like that. That kind of soft a- activism, if you like, kind of having those individual conversations and again, keeping that dialogue opening. It needs to happen on an institutional level, definitely, but I think it needs to happen on a personal level as well. And that's when I'm talking to kind of my work colleagues and I you know, I tell them about some of the stuff that I get, get up to, get on with, you know, and and they do listen and they do take the time. When I came out to a lot of my Muslim friends, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I, I won't say, I can't really say where they stand but specifically, but they took out the time and they listened to what I had to say, and they, you know, and and they listened properly, and they were like, you know, you know, they gave a crap, mm-hmm. and essentially, and and I think that's what it takes because when you don't have any, I mean, a lot of them don't actually have, a, they might have gay colleagues and stuff that they work with, but they certainly don't have a lot of gay friends. Mm-hmm. I was kind of one of the the first, if you like, but you know, kind of to be in such an intimate social circle at university, and then to one one of them to come out as gay, it's like. Oh right, okay. Well, in in and I'm sure in their head, like I don't know how to deal with this. It's like cognitive dissonance. This is a gay person. I am not. What do I do with you? What do I do with this entity? Is probably what they were thinking in their head, though probably not in those kind of words. <laughs> and it, I mean, I'm not exactly the antidote to homophobia, and I don't think a gay person is an antidote to homophobia. It's not our job to be going around kind of educating people all the time. It's just like, well, you know, you shouldn't be thinking this way, and I shall tell you why because I'm in a good position to do so. But sometimes that needs to happen. You need to be able to have those conversations with, with people who are close because it's very easy to say, well, if somebody's homophobic to you, you know what, cut them out. That's fine. You know, you can, you've can you got other friends to rely on. But when that person is a very close friend to you, when that's your sister, when that's your mother, when that's your brother, when that's your best friend, you don't want to cut them off because you value their relationship beyond just your own sexuality. And sometimes it takes time to be able to work on that. It's hard. It takes time and it will take time. But from what I've seen with my friends, a lot of them have come round. Um, some of them were slightly hesitant to begin with. They didn't really get it. But what they eventually realize, um, some, of them, some of them a little bit more quickly than others, is that nothing's changed. Like, I'm still the same me. I'm still the same kind of person. And it takes time. And they realize that, you know what, you're just the same as you ever were. The only thing that's actually changed is the person that you're attracted to. And how often does that really come into a conversation with friends? Not all that often. How many times are you going to go around saying, well, this is the last person I've just shagged. What about you? Like, I mean, yeah, it happens in some circles, but it certainly doesn't happen in mine. Um, And you just kind of carry on talking about the same old things. I talk about films and cinema with my one friend. Then I talk about music with my other friends. And then, you know, I talk about Game of Thrones and Star Wars. Yeah, you're a whole person. And and sometimes those personal stories are the most important. I mean, that's the thing I think I'd like to, like, really hone down on, which is that your sexuality is a, for me anyway, it's a part of you. I don't think it's the entirety of you. If that's how you wish to identify, that's fine. That's on an individual basis. I don't. There's other things that I get up to that I'm interested, like, you know, classical music and film scores and you know, uh, writing poetry and, you know, and stuff like that. So, you know, my life is 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 a massive kind of, uh, <laughs> to use that a metaphor, it is a rainbow collective <laughs> of many different things. It's not just sexuality. Yes, it's a part of that. It's very important and it's heavily influential in a, in a lot of what I do. But, you know, would I say that it's kind of my number one defining feature? No. And is my Muslimness my one defining feature? No, it's not. There are different levels here. And I think the one level is Islam as a whole and Islam as a whole, um, I don't th- because it's implemented differently in different places, different interpretations. I don't think we'll ever get full acceptance there, and I think we have to be comfortable with that, and we have to be mindful that there will always be people who will say it's not acceptable. So I think that's that's one level. Then in terms of the interpretation of that and the implementation of that. And then you've got the society's views and how people react to LGBTQI plus Muslims. 
Um, that's another level. And I think that part is changing. I think globally you can see that a lot of countries are attracting their um, their, their uh, sort of home uh, anti-gay laws. Um, so that's great, seeing all of those things. And then if you then come down to the individual, so for me it's about the individual dialogue. Um, I was doing some analysis on uh, n some statistics and I was looking at how many Muslims there are in the country and how many people, generally, percentage-wise, uh, in the country, according to the census, ad identify as uh, non-heteronormative. And we're looking at, with the number of Muslims in the UK, just looking at the UK, we're looking at potentially thousands, you know, up to 100,000 or more Muslims, if the percentages are right. Wow. Mm. And we have a very small percentage of those member members in Hidayah. But every conversation that we have with a Muslim or a non-Muslim expands people's minds. Mm. And I think the key thing here is to continue that dialogue. And that's what Hidayah is about, expanding that dialogue, looking at different ways in which we can talk to people. And for me, it's always about the individual support. So when you talk to each person, their individual view of the world is going to be different. And how they view their shame, how they view their identity, how they view their place in society and it, their place in their family is going to be individual. And then helping them to reconcile that with who they are. And we initially started off as a support group for LGBT Muslims because the four of us were like, oh, there can't be just four LGBT Muslims in the UK. Um, and thankfully we were wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what initially started out as was just meant to be a kind of an event that happens once a month has turned into something bigger and better. Um, and the way, like, it's changing is the fact that we've been putting ourselves out there. We've been um, running events with other organisations. So most recently we ran a series of roundtable events with British Muslim Secular Democracy, which I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I don't think would have even been possible. Uh, an organisation that primarily caters towards Muslims doing an event with people who are LGBT and Muslim, just would have been unheard of. Um, and that for us is, you know, for me, that's how the tide is changing, is we're doing more partnered events with kind of Muslim organisations. It's also putting ourselves with other organisations such as Stonewall to say, look, we exist as people of colour, as LGBT, as Muslims. You know, we need to be inclusive of everything. And so for me, it's the vehicle, and obviously I'm somewhat biased being the, one of the founders of Hidayah, but the vehicle of which we do that is through education, is through going to universities, is partnering up with other organisations. And it's having that dialogue and keeping that dialogue open is how I feel like the tide will change. It's not going to be a change that happens overnight, but it will be something that I think in about 20, 30 years' time is going to be far better accepted. And that will be through vehicles like Hidayah and places like this, because ultimately, you know, we can only speak about our own lived experiences. No one else can speak on behalf of us. And who else is going to speak on behalf of us except us? When I when I was kind of coming to my when it coming to terms and coming to realization that you know I'm gay and Muslim, all that kind of stuff, you know, I looked into theology and I tried to kind of find that justification that you know what that I'm I'm allowed to be and this is okay and stuff. And I, and I just didn't really find it. Um, and then, so what I turned to, I kind of turned to all the principles of Islam that I was brought up with. That, you know, Allah Ta'ala is um, passionate and he's the most merciful. That's the one thing that stuck with me. And then came the other bit, which is that your sexuality, is it innate or is it something that you kind of pick and choose and stuff like that? Um, so obviously your sexuality is not something that you choose. It is something that's within you. Therefore, why would God specifically create a group of people to, to kind of burn and punish in hell for something that they cannot choose. You cannot be punished for something that you did not choose. Yeah, that's, that's not really within your power to do so. Uh, really important. And then if that's, because if that's true, then the entire idea of being God, of, of being all merciful, just doesn't hold any weight anymore. That just doesn't make sense. The entire foundation of Islam, if you like, just starts to crumble before you. So I kind of, that, I came to an impasse really. I kind of, it was one of the two, it was one of two things. It's like either God exists or he doesn't. Um, he, and I was, and I was like, you know, he, he is a merciful God. I do believe that. So then I, so then I thought, you know, there has to be. I don't know where that way is, 
but it's there and I will one day and I will find that. And Alhamdulillah, I've been, you know, very lucky. I prayed and that came to me and that came to me uh, partly through Hidayah and partly through personal reading and stuff like that. Um, so I kind of, you know, ev- you know, everything kind of became a lot more better. If you, I mean, it's a horrible way <laughs> of saying things got better. But, you know, things did eventually start falling into place for me, which, you know, which is great. Wow, what an amazing episode. Thank you so much for participating. It was amazing to hear all your stories. And thank you very much for listening. If you would like further information or support, head to our website at hidayahlgbt.co.uk. Hidayah is a support group that amplifies the voices of LGBTQI plus Muslims. We campaign for social justice to defeat the stigma, taboo and discrimination faced by many within our communities. Our aim is to gain social acceptance as LGBTQI plus Muslims. Join us next week. We'll be discussing religion and culture and how they impact our lives. Thank you.